Welcome everybody to our first spring program of the Friends of ASM Collections. Today we welcome a speaker who has graced us with his presence many times over the last few years, uh, for which we are always very grateful. I want to thank uh, Susan Thompson and Jen Tillman for their work, their co-chairs of our program and social events committee. And they've worked hard to create these programs to share our collections and to share expertise such as we'll be hearing about today. And take it away, Susan. So oh, today we have the privilege of welcoming distinguished research social scientist, Dr. David Yetman from the University of Arizona Southwest Center to present his program, How One Cactus Introduced Me to the Indigenous People of Northwest Mexico. David's extensive travels in the Mexican state of Sonora reflect his specialization in the cultures of the Guarjillos, Mayos, Apatas, and Ceres. He has written multiple publications on the ethnobotany of columnar cacti, and his books include The Organ Pipe Cactus and The Great Cacti Ethnobotany and Biogeography of Columnar Cacti. David is a two-time Emmy winner as host of the PBS Desert Speaks and his PBS series in the Americas with David Yetman. He is a voice for the desert regions and their peoples. David, we're honored to have you share your decades of experiences with us today. Uh, let's see, Dr. Yetman, following Dr. Yetman's presentation, there will be about a 10 to 15 minute period for questions. And Diane Didamore, Associate Curator of Ethnological Collections, will show a few baskets from ASM's Northwest Mexico collection, which complement David's presentation. Thank you. Take it away, David. Thank you, Susan. I assume that most of you who are uh, associated with the museum were not born in Arizona. My guess is that probably only 25 to 30 percent of you can claim even close to that. But I also suspect that those of you who weren't born in Arizona recall your first view of a saguaro cactus. I certainly do. I was 12. Uh, Tucson was less than one tenth the size it is now. My father and I were driving at night up Oracle Road and then all of I was a kid from New Jersey and all of a sudden here these massive shapes loomed in front of me and uh, that that hooked me that one experience hooked me on saguaros. Um, so for the last 120 years or so I've been uh, quite mesmerized by the plants. I want to take you through a few uh, views of saguaros and then talk a little bit about some of their deeper connections to the universe. <clears throat> the, uh, one, one wonderful thing about saguaros is that you can look at them and with about a 50% accuracy, you can tell what season we are looking at. This picture was uh, taken in Sonoran Desert National Monument, which is you get to by driving south of Interstate 8 to the uh, west of Casa Grande. The uh, peak in the distance is Javelina Peak uh, in the Vecchel Mountains, or the Slate Mountains, actually. <clears throat> uh, again, this is a, a very good Sonoran Desert view. Saguaros are found only in the Sonoran Desert, um, and for the most part, only in Arizona and Sonora. There are a few in California, but not enough to qualify California as a state that has saguaros. There, there are probably fewer than, oh, a couple hundred in California. And the rest of the Sonoran Desert, there are old 100 million of them. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> um, we can tell quite a bit about looking at saguaros. This is a fine population um, near Mammoth, Arizona, which is uh, to the north of Tucson, uh, near the San Pedro River in the San Pedro Valley. Uh, this, these are old saguaros. First of all, the rings that you see there are generally indicators of a cold winter um, and or also a time when it has been very dry. Saguaros will live sometimes as much as 200 years. My guess is that these are probably in the vicinity of 100 years old. 
But if you look at the ground around there, you see there are only a couple of young ones. And what that shows is that it's been a tough time for what we call recruiting of the plants. They um, recruit only, the new ones appear only in very special years. And the last time we had a good season for recruitment in Southern Arizona, it was in 1983, following the floods. And 1983 and 84 were very, years with very wet summer and fall. And those years were good for recruitment. But since then, particularly since 93 and the drought, there are very, very few young saguaros coming up. Um, we can also tell that these um, are, because of their very tallness, they probably are in their last few decades of life. Uh, they still grow and they will, even after they begin to die, they will continue to grow. They are remarkably resilient creatures. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the flowers are their crowning glory. Uh, this is a photograph taken by my colleague, Kevin Holtine of the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. Um, what's instructive about these is that they are luscious looking, as you can tell. But if you were to stick your finger into deep into any of those flowers, it would come out wet, covered with nectar. And bats, which are the principal pollinators, but not the only pollinators, love that nectar, as do bees and some hummingbirds and moths, particularly night critters. Generally, flowers that are white are pollinated at night. But bats flying in to get that nectar then will go past those those anthers that you can see covered with pollen. And as they come out, they are then their heads are brushed with pollen. They go to another plant or another flower, pick up more, exchange it. And that's the main way that saguaro flowers get pollinated. They don't self-pollinate. They have to have pollen from a different plant. Uh, next slide. But flowers become fruits. And my hope is that most of you will have had a chance to have eat saguaro fruits because they're really quite delectable. They have a, a somewhat drier consistency than other flowers do, but they do taste like a relatively sweet fig. And they have seeds that are nourishing, they're rich in oil and protein. Um, next slide, please. And here you see what they look like. You can just pick that piece up and pop it in your mouth and it is delicious. That fruit has made the difference between interesting life or even life and boring life or no life for the Tahanaptam people. The saguaro is their most important plant. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is a this photograph uh, was is in the, by the way, the collection at the Arizona State Museum. This was taken by Helga Taiwis in about 1970. Uh, and it shows an autumn woman gathering a saguaro fruit. Back in the middle 1960s, if you traveled west on Ajo Road to what is what we call now Three Points, there was a store there. And it was the closest uh, store to most of the Tohono Autumn Reservation. And Autumn they would come in both to buy things, but also to sell stuff that they had. Two of the things that you could get there, you can't get there anymore, was one, bottled chiltepin peppers, which grow in the Babakiver Mountains. And they, the, uh, the women would cook them a little bit in oil and vinegar, and then they would uh, can them, would bottle them and sell them there. But the other thing was occasionally you could find saguaro fruit juice. And it was marvelous stuff. It would be boiled down and concentrated, uh, and they would sell that then as a syrup. But also it was the basis for the wine that they made for their very special ceremonies. Um, next slide, please. The women and families, even as late as the mid 1970s had special summer camps where they would go, including in Saguaro National Monument, which is now Saguaro National Park, the West Unit. They had their own places that each summer they went to. And this is Juanita Cahill. Uh, she is uh, winnowing the uh, saguaro fruits. You can see them drying. They have to be fairly dry before they uh, try to put them up for long-term keeping or they will become moldy. But the, what I discovered after speaking with them and reading was that the saguaro is so important for the autumn that their calendar is based upon the reproductive cycle of the saguaro cactus. 
which is extraordinary. One plant that they find so important that they base their annual calendar upon its very stages. Um, and of course, their happiest time of year is when the saguaros come out in fruit where they can eat them in huge numbers. And it, they are wonderful to eat. Then they also make products that will dry them uh, to make a, a kind of a fruit leather. Uh, they will express them and save the juice. They will save the seeds, a number of uses. When I became familiar with how important it was, it struck me as being odd uh, from an international standpoint that a cactus would be the most important plant for people. And that truly is indicative of a desert people, that a cactus would become the very important basis of their culture. And indeed, without that saguaro uh, production of fruit on which they could always rely, the Tahana Autumn would have had a very difficult time in some years making it through the year. They look forward with great joy to the fruit as the first sweet thing they could get after the long spring drought and maybe even the winter drought. Next slide, please. Now, one thing about swirl cactuses is, is they, they, uh, they do get into arguments, as you can see here, and sometimes those arguments get rather severe. Um, these are crestate saguaros. Um, these are actually uh, south of Kino Bay in Sonora. But I found that the argument must have been over something very important. Uh, what causes that crestate formation? Um, no one knows. A lot of research has gone into it, but nobody knows. But nowhere else do you find saguaros arguing the way they are here. And the arguments can become serious, as the next slide will show. Here you see the armies, they are gathered. The advanced troops are discussing things, but uh, the saguaros on the left have the uh, old man cactus, the sanitas, uh, ready to do work for them. The guards are standing there, and I never did find out how that battle went. But clearly, this was shaping up to be a, a war of cosmic proportions. Uh, if you look very carefully and notice the habitat here, you will see that the saguaros here are growing on very flat land. In the, in the saguaro forest that we have in Arizona and northern Sonora, they don't grow there. They like to have a very well-drained soil uh, with um, even rough rock in it that will, when it rains, will not puddle. But these saguaros live in very sandy soil. This is probably only about two or three miles from the Gulf of California. So they do grow here in the flats. In Arizona, they tend not to grow in the flats. They grow up in the hillsides. There's another reason for that. The hillsides tend to be warmer in the wintertime. The cold air sits down in the lowlands and on the hillsides where the warm air collects and, and hangs because it's lighter than the cold air, they will be more protected from freezing. So is the farther you get into Mexico, <clears throat> excuse me, the more likely you are to find them growing in the flatlands, particularly out toward the Gulf of California. How far south do they go? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot about this. Uh, this proves that uh, longevity is a virtue in plants as well as animals. Uh, this uh, saguaro grows near Dudleyville up in the San Pedro Valley, and I believe it has 42 arms. Um, I tried counting them and it's not as easy as you might think, but clearly it has done very well. You'll notice there are no other saguaros around there, indicating that it grew at a time when the climate was different. My guess is that it's over 150 years old. And as I look very closely at it, when I, after I took the photograph, it is showing some signs of, of senescence, which means its uh, life is coming to an end. So like the most of us within the next two or three decades, it's probably uh, not going to be there anymore, but it's a hero. It's an outlier. It's a huge and very successful plant. If you figure that <clears throat> Each one of those arms over its lifetime has produced hundreds of thousands of seeds, each one of them. Then you can see how prolific saguaros are in terms of seeds and fruit. And those fruit then have, for me, been a tie in to the nature of an indigenous people of such great importance in Southern Arizona, as a matter of fact, in all of the Southwest. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the the map here shows the yellowish portion, the sort of mustard yellow part, uh, shows the Sonoran Desert. 
Um, if you look and see where the Colorado River is in the western part of Arizona, what's interesting is that saguaros do not grow in any number at all west of the Colorado, and they are not found at all in Baja California. And you can see that that yellowish part in Baja California goes almost to the south. But what is perplexing, at least at first, is that Baja California has a lot of very large columnar cacti but not saguaros. Why is that? The principal reason is saguaros need to have summer rains. The uh, flowers come out in April and May. The fruits come out in June and, and July. And our time from evolutionary standpoint to hit the ground just before the summer rains come. And the rains then give moisture to uh, enable the seeds to germinate they germinate and there's enough moisture there to enable the seedlings to survive in a good year. But west of there and in Baja California, there are no summer rains. The summer rains don't occur. So the conditions that saguaros need to have for reproduce never take place. There's one place where they do take place and that is in extreme Southern Baja California. You can see at the very tip where that orange color is just, you can see La Paz there in the South. That is still Sonoran Desert, and there are a lot of columnar cacti there. But where there is summer rain, the vegetation is so thick that saguaros can't compete with the other plants. So where the conditions are that summer rains are, are going to arrive, saguaros can't make it because there's too many comp competitors. So they are pretty well stuck to that yellow portion of Arizona and Sonora, and with the exception of that, 100 or so plants don't even grow west of the Colorado River, nowhere else. So if you see a saguaro growing wild, you're about 99.787% sure that it's either in Arizona or Sonora. And in Sonora, they really don't grow in any numbers much south of Wyamas. They do grow almost down to the state of Sinaloa, but only under very, very special circumstances and particularly on hillsides among volcanic rock. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I, I threw this slide in because it's just an extraordinary photograph. This is a barrel cactus. We, we have the uh, barrel cactus in the uh, Sonoran Desert around us, the feral cactus Wislazini. This is a feral cactus or a barrel that grows only on the island of Santa Catalina in the Gulf of California. And my friend Jesus Garcia, who is a naturalist with the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum is standing next to us, showing how very tall that cactus is. But in the background, you will also see that there are very large columnar cacti growing. Um, those are the next uh, cactus, which I will get to after we go through the organ pipes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the organ pipe cactus now, they grow in Arizona, Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, but they grow in relatively small numbers and they don't get very big. They do produce fruit. Um, I have a, a, uh, an organ pipe in my yard that I've had for about 20 years. And it last this year produced a fruit, the only one it has ever produced. I did not eat it because I was gone at the time when it uh, matured and I came back to find a dried out stump. But in Sonora, they grow in utterly improbable numbers. There used to be, when I was first doing field work in Southern Sonora back in the 1990s, um, about a, a 10,000 acre portion where there were over a hundred plants per acre. They were so thick. Most of that has now been bulldozed and turned into agricultural production. But here we have a, a forest growing um, in the southern part of Sonora. Um, and my friend there with his machete is a very close friend of mine who, who died a few years ago. Um, he is a Mayo. Mayos are very close relatives of Yaquis. The Mayos live mostly along the coast of southern Sonora. And for them, their most important plant by far is the organ pipe cactus. And I'll try to show you why and maybe why I began to see a pattern. If the saguaro is the most important plant for the Tanahana autumn and the 
pitayo or organ pipe is the most important plant for the myos, maybe I'm onto something. So let's take a look farther. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the uh, organ pipes also have a crested form. Um, here, by the way, the, uh, the straw hat there, the fellow with the straw hat is Jeff Bannister, who is now director of the Southwest Center, my department at the university. And my friend Vicente also uh, took me to show me this, wanted to know what it is. It's a funny story about this. The, uh, the Maya word for the organ pipe is Aki, A-A-Q-U-I. And they have a special word for the crestate they call it Aki Nabura. And Nabura means something like good for nothing. And they won't eat the fruits. They do produce fruits, but they won't eat them. And the reason is, why would you eat a fruit from such a misshapen plant? There's got to be something wrong with it. And they don't need to worry because they have so many. Uh, next slide. They do get rather large. Um, here are two of my friends standing quite away from it. That um, actually is about 35 feet tall with uh, two or 300 arms. And on a good year, they will get a couple of thousand fruits from a plant like that. And there are countless millions of the plants in the Mayo territory. It's really a, uh, a, a, a place where the pitayas, the fruits are as important to the Mayos as the, the saguaro fruits are to the Ta'ana Atum, except the Mayos get more rainfall and historically in many places have been able to plant their cornfields with regularity, which has really been much more difficult for the Ta'ana Atum who use the Akchin form of, of, of flash flood irrigation and their desert is much drier than this. Uh, next slide, please. The fruits, uh, the fruits. Um, the, the flowers in of the organ pipe appear in um, sometimes late March, early April, and the fruits are in full production by early June and go through uh, the end of July, sometimes into August. And they are there by the thousand. And these are as good as they look or even better. They are the delectable cactus fruit. They're much juicier than the saguaro fruit. And for that reason, they, they are not easily dried and preserved. Um, but you can eat 20 or 30 of these, as I have on many occasions, and keep wanting more. They're uh, very, very sweet. They also come in five or six different colors. And each color has a different flavor. And each color has a different name given them by the, the Mayos. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another friend of mine. This is uh, Maria Jesusita Buitimea. Um, and she is in the village of City Bampo, which is right in the middle of the, this vast forest of organ pipes. Um, she is removing with great dexterity the, 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 uh, the skin, the rind uh, from, the, from the fruits. And it takes a certain dexterity to do it because you have to scrape off the spines first. When the fruits ripen, the spines begin to come off and the riper, the easier they are to come off. But if you want to sell them as she does, you have to pick them just a little bit before they're fully ripe and let them ripen as you get on the bus to take them into Navajoa, this, the nearest city, which is an, an hour and a half uh, bus ride and walk away. But she and many other Mayos collect these fruits and they sell them in the market. So say a town north of Hermosillo, uh, just off um, Mexico Route 15, um, Carbo, where there is a strain of organ pipes and there were a lot of them that produce huge fruits. And the people of Carbo routinely in July gather them in buckets, take them to the market in Hermosillo, and they make quite a good living in the, that particular time. Some years the production is not as great as it is in other years, but they always uh, are able to harvest the fruits. And I don't know how they refrain from eating them all, but they view them as a, an economic resource. They don't want to glut on them. They want to be able to sell them and they are good. What we have, uh, I've been working with some folks in this particular village, uh, providing them with dryers and they were able to produce uh, a fruit leather, uh, which they still market and they make a uh, jam uh, from them, which is one of the finest things in the world. The other thing they have, one family has a freezer. And they, so they will take the pulp and cook it just a little bit and then freeze it quickly. And it makes one of the finest 
uh, raspadillas, the uh, shaved ice of desserts that you will ever have. Next slide, please. Here, I, I show you this to show the different, um, the, the different cactus fruits. Um, the next cactus we will be talking about is the Cardon Sahueso, which is the most important plant for the series. And the, those are at the top at 12 o'clock and at 11 and one, those are the fruits of the uh, Sahueso. They also are extremely rich and tasty uh, with much larger seeds. And I can't show you a photograph because I can't find mine. Um, but they, uh, the, uh, the series were able to gather thousands of these fruits, separate the seeds from the pulp, which they would eat or make into wine, and dry the seeds, and then place them in clay pots and seal them. And they would keep forever. Um, a number of years ago, there were some pots discovered in a small cave up on the, uh, the uh, Sierra Seri that had seeds in them that were probably 50 to 60 years old. And they were still tasty. They weren't viable, probably. They were still good. All right, at about two o'clock then, you have a uh, organ pipe fruit that has been, uh, has scraped, has its spine scraped away. Then the next one at three o'clock is an organ pipe fruit that still has the spines on it. Next at about uh, 430 are saguaro fruits. Um, and actually, there are a mixture there. The lower one here at 435, the one at the very, no, the, at about 435 back up uh, the other way. Now, yeah, now go down to the saguaro fruits. Right there, though, that's a saguaro fruit, but right below it, attached to it, is an organ pipe fruit. Um, the saguaro fruits are, have their own virtue. Each one of these is quite different, but for the series, the Cardon Sahueso is the most important plant. For the Mayos, the Pitayo, or the Aki, or the organ pipe, the Stenoceras thurberi, is the most important plant. And of course, for the autumn, the saguaro is the most important plant. Now, at the very bottom, at six o'clock, we have the last one, which we'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. And this is the Echo cactus. It's a, uh, um, a, a fairly close relative of the Sonora, uh, the uh, saguaro, and I will show you photographs of it. And I will show you that these look formidable. They look as if uh, they might be very difficult, they're not. And I'll talk more about them in a little bit. Next slide, please. Um, to tell you that the organ pipe is important uh, doesn't tell you in any way the complexity and importance of the organ pipe for the Mayos. This is a fence that you see uh, Mayos, by the way, like to live apart from their neighbors. In villages, they like villages, but they like to have their houses clearly demarked and set apart. Yaquis, they're very close neighbors to the north who are linguistically very close. Yaquis and Mayos can understand each other from their language. Um, they like to have their houses much closer together. And there were probably cultural and historical reasons for that, but this particular house, vintage Mayo house, surrounded by a fence, and that fence is made entirely from the ribs of organ pipe cacti. So you can see that it took a lot of organ pipes to make that fence called Chinami in Mayo. Um, and they are so prolific and important that the cultures, Mayo culture simply could not have developed the way it was. It is now without those. Next slide. And in addition to being great fencing material, if you look at the uh, vigas on uh, the, the roofing joist up on, on uh, the roof here, those are ribs from organ pipe cacti. Those are organ, they're not just the ribs, they are the actual stems that have had the green material removed. And if they are kept dry, they, they will put slats of organ pipe uh, cross pieces on top and then put a heavy rich clay rich mud on top. If that is kept intact, they'll last forever. If they don't get wet, if they get wet, they will start to rot. So they're a building material and the door to the right of the woman, the green door there, is also made out of organ pipe wood, um, which has been cut and carefully uh, formed into a door. So it's, it's a resource for lumber and for food and for a number of medicinal products as well and shade. So the organ pipe cactus is the most important plant for the Mayos. Next slide, please. 
I show this slide because this is probably the most, excuse me, just a second. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna turn my phone off, I forgot to. That's your, that's not my fault. I can't, can't pause it there. Um, Sorghum pipe cactus is growing out of the church at Aguana near the town of Alamos. It is probably the most venerated plant in all of Mexico, except perhaps for El Tule, the great bald cypress in, in, uh, in the central valleys of Oaxaca. But here it is, an organ pipe cactus growing out of the side of a church. And if you can see the uh, ribbons on the bottom, each year there's a fiesta in the town of Aduana. And the reason for this fiesta is to venerate this cactus, which supposedly the, the Virgin Mary appears in from time to time. Um, it is healthy, although at, at one point, maybe 20 years ago, there were so many candles placed at the base uh, that the wax caught on fire and singed the very bottom of the cactus. But it has since recovered, is still growing, and how it grows there, people view simply as a miracle, and the Virgin Mary is responsible for that miracle. And I assume, I haven't seen her for about 10 years, uh, but I assume that the plant is doing well. I don't know whether it produces fruit or not, but the mere fact that it's alive is in itself quite an astonishing thing. Next slide, please. Now, the, the, uh, the next plant, uh, which is in many ways the most sensational, is the Cardon Salueso. It is the most important plant for the series. Uh, they grow in a lot of them, and they grow a tremendous size. They become the largest of all of the northern Mexico columnar cacti, and the second largest uh, of all columnar cacti, and I'll show you the largest uh, a little bit later. This is a grove um, that uh, still some of them are alive near Kino Bay. Um, and he's, the, the size of these beggars description because the rainfall there is about five inches a year. Our rainfall in Tucson is about 12 inches and our saguaros grow very slowly. So here on five inches, they grow very quickly and big and they grow in soils that saguaros have a hard time with. They can grow in very clay rich soils that don't drain well. Uh, one of the reasons they grow so well there is that they are supremely adapted to collect dew. Every night for six months of the year, the temperature drops very quickly after sunset and dew appears on them and trickles down between the ribs down to the roots and provides moisture and they will grow in that little rainfall but with with that source uh, always reliable because the gulf here the water is only uh, perhaps two miles away next slide they do get very large uh, this is um, a friend of mine dr um, martinez from unam if this plant is about 100 miles south of the u.s border uh, southwest of Pitiquito between Pitiquito and Caborca. And as you can see, it gets massive. You can see also that the tops of the branches are covered with fruits and those fruits are really delectable. They are very, very good. One nice thing about the fruits, if you re recall seeing the, the felty appearance they had back in the fruit slide, uh, you can hold them and they don't pierce your skin. They look as if they might, uh, you, you don't want to get them too close to your face because they have little prickles, but the uh, purple fruit is delectable. I don't have any pictures of that because all the ones that uh, the series that I had, I can't find anymore. Next slide, please. I show you this to show a remarkable fact about the Cardon Salesas. This plant, when I took this photograph, was about 30 years old. It was planted um, in a, <laughs> I believe over a septic tank in Kino Bay. Um, and it was about a yard tall when it was planted. In that time it has shot up, which shows it is very responsive to water. But even if you gave a saguaro that much water, it would not grow anywhere nearly that fast. These can grow very fast. They are very responsive to rainfall. And because they are so big, they can tolerate drought very, very well. Remember only five inches. 
and they are prolific in Baja California and the wettest place in most of Baja California gets no more than five inches a year. The very southern tip they do, but, but elsewhere, no. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, on a, a sand dune growth uh, with my wife, Lynn, standing here. Uh, you can see that, that they're growing in sand. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. They're growing in sand, which most cacti can't do because the dunes migrate. But they are able to. And how do they keep themselves upright in sand? They send out outrigger type roots as high as the cactus. So there will, for if this cactus is 35 feet tall, they will send out roots 35 feet tall as outrigger. So they can sustain the winds, the hurricanes that come up the Gulf don't do them much damage. Next slide. I want you to look carefully at this particular grove. Um, if you look down in the trunk at the base, right at the very bottom of there's a dark triangle. And if you look carefully, you can see a little small white spot in there. Uh, that's me with my hat on. That shows you how big these cacti are. And they make a complete circle, which led me to believe that the Ceres probably planted these deliberately a long time ago, so that when they were fishing, and they were hunters and gatherers and great fisher um, and in the, the days before they were Europeanized, uh, they would have a place where there would be shade at any hour of the day. If you get inside there, it is 20 degrees cooler than it is outside. And you can sit in there, there are no spines to bother you. And they are so strong and so big that they provide a fortress. And the next slide, uh, you can see how big the trunk of them is. Uh, this is a standard size trunk for a Cardon Sahueso growing in the sand dunes. Uh, it's more like a tree uh, than, than it is a cactus uh, trunk, and it provides great strength and stability. Oddly enough, when they die, the ribs are not anywhere nearly as strong as the saguaro ribs are. The saguaro ribs are much stouter, and the Ceres use the saguaro ribs in some of their construction, but the Cardon Sahueso ribs, since they're not as strong, they don't use as much. The Ceres have a custom that when a baby is born, they bury a, the placenta at the base, usually of a Cardon Sahueso, and that becomes, that plant becomes uh, identified with that child and ultimately the adult. And when the time I was spending in the, a lot of time in the series in the 70s and 80s, many of the older men could point to old Cardon Sahuesos in the vicinity of, of Desemboque that were their plants. They were identified with them because their parents had planted the placenta at the base of, of the tree. And as the trees grew older, the, the cacti grew older, they became identified with them. Wonderful story. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The Cardon Sahuesos grow in enormous numbers. And this is one of the islands, Melisas, off the coast of Guaymas. And you can see it is very heavily covered with mostly Cardon Sahuesos or Sahuesos. The white that you see at the tip of the branches is uh, seagulls and perhaps ospreys that are roosting on them and watching. And they defecate on them, producing that white effect. Um, one of the reasons these plants can grow so thick, uh, as proposed by my late friends, Rodney Hastings and Ray Turner, was that they are cut off from the mainland and rodents have no access to them. And rodents are great predators of seeds. So they believe that these islands uh, were, have such a dense population because they were free of the rodents and they were free to grow without any interference uh, from those herbivores. Next slide. <clears throat> Here you can see what it's like on that island. It's a mixture of organ pipes and cardon sahuesos. But if you add the little mimosas that are growing on here, you do not run through this forest. It's very difficult to move through. Oddly enough, it is not a great producer of fruits. And I have no idea why that is. The flowers and the fruits are somewhat limited and I can't give you an explanation for that. You can also see the frigate birds uh, that are circling above. Um, <clears throat> they're part of the whole scene there at this great forest. Next slide, please. 
they get very tall. This is um, a photograph taken near Catavignan in Baja California. My late friend, uh, Yar Patrician, who was for many years, one of the great presenters on the Desert Speaks, uh, Yar died last month. Um, but this is a typical huge Cardon Sueso uh, growing in Baja California. They get very big. They don't produce as much fruit in the northern part, in the southern part they do, but they grow in enormous numbers way to the south of the peninsula. So it's a great, uh, the great cactus that replaces in the peninsula, replaces the saguaro cactus. Next slide, please. Another just purely aesthetic phenomenon I have to show you is how Cardon Sauesos intermingle with Bujum trees. And this is one of my favorite places in the world. This is Montevideo Canyon, which is 10 miles or so inland from Valle de los Angeles, uh, which is directly across the Gulf from the, the uh, Seri town of Desemboque. <clears throat> and you can see the Bujums do very well here. The tallest Bujum ever recorded came from this area. It was 81 feet tall. And uh, Bujum Bob Humphreys uh, measured it and wrote about it. Uh, if you want a, the, the finest place in the world to uh, camp, this is it. And we were fortunate when I, when I took this picture that a hurricane had passed by about a month early. So the, the Bujums were out in leaf, which is the best way to see them. I got to show you a couple more slides of the Bujums. They're such extraordinary creatures. Wherever the Bujums grow, you will find the Cardone Sauesos growing as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Baja California as well. This is uh, near Catavina. And you can see the Bujums and the granites uh, all together um, to the left. Here is a Lofa cereus, an old man cactus at the extreme left side. Um, <clears throat> what a wonderland for the geologist and for the botanist to see the beauty of all these growing together in a, like nowhere else in the world. So in, in addition to being ethnobotanically important, it's just absolutely beautiful place. Next. <clears throat> and the Bujums get very strange indeed. They grow in all shapes. Um, and they grow only in two places. And the sort of central west, uh, east portion of Baja California, and in one small mountain range in Sonora. And the ones in uh, Sonora don't grow as big. They certainly grow many of them. Unfortunately, it is now in a private hunting preserve, so it's very difficult to gain access to it. But the Bujums, they were close relative of the Ocotillo. These are uh, Fokieria arborescence, and then the uh, Ocotillo that we have here is <clears throat> the Fokieria splendens. So they're, they're in the same genus, unlike any other in the world. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, moving right along, as Marlon Perkins used to say, this is the H.O. cactus. Um, and this cactus is the most important plant for the Wadihio people. The Wadihios are an indigenous group closely related to the Rarangori or Tarahumaras who live inland from the Mayos. Um, they are, their lands are right adjacent to the Mayos. They live north on the Rio Mayo into Chihuahua and uh, are not, uh, have not a, a huge presence historically because they tend to be reclusive, their numbers are smaller, and uh, they did not live in an agriculturally abundant area. But I learned a huge amount about the HOs, both from the Mayos, and this is in Mayo country, and from the Wadi Hios. You can see the fruits here on the HOs, and they are, uh, they look as if they're gonna just kill you if you try to pick them. Uh, next slide, please. You can see them growing there, and they look devastating. And the scientific name for the, um, the H.O. is Pachycereus pectin aboriginum, which means Indian comb. If you pick those, you think, I can't possibly touch them, but they're actually kind of inoffensive and you can use them for a comb. I don't recommend it, but I have done so and I did not get any spines in my scalp. Uh, those fruits then, they do uh, mature into a delectable fruit. Next slide. <clears throat> My friend Vicente here is harvesting them. They're somewhat easier to harvest than the, or the uh, pitayas because they they tend to fall off the plants more easily and the spines don't prick you the way the organ pipe fruits do. This is all in Mayo country now. This is a um, photograph is taken about 40 miles south of Navajoa, almost to the Sinaloan border. The HOs grow only marginally in the Sonoran Desert. In, in Baja California, they grow abundantly, but 
they tend to be more tropical. And so where the Sonoran Desert ends, they meet the HOs and a few of them make it up into the, to the Sonoran Desert, but they prefer to grow where there's a little more rainfall and they don't like freezing. Next slide. And this is the fruit. Um, it's as tasty as it looks. Uh, you can scoop it out and eat it right the way it is. But what is most interesting, you can see that the seeds there are quite large, much larger than saguaro seeds. The, the women will collect these and they will then wash them and save the pulp and the juice uh, for other purposes, but dry the seeds and grind them and make them into tortillas. And they call them tortilla de semilla de hecho, the hecho seed tortillas, and they are very good. I'm afraid that nobody's making them anymore because you can imagine how much labor is involved and it's so much easier and simpler to buy tortillas than it is to gather all those fruits, clean the seeds away, dry them and grind them. But I have had that wonderful uh, culinary experience of the hecho seed tamales, uh, uh, tortillas, and they are marvelous. Next, please. And here is where they grow in sometimes great numbers and you can see how many fruits they are and what a valuable resource they have been for the Mayos and for the Wadi Hios. Uh, they are the, um, for the upland peoples, these tend to grow more on rolling country, not necessarily, but slightly above where the organ pipes grow. They will mingle, but the HOs tend to move into the hills a little bit more. So where people live in the hills, they have more HO fruits. Where they live in the flats, they have more organ pipe fruits. Next slide. The plants get very big. And I, I point this out because this is a, a, a couple of plants growing in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec or near the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the state of Oaxaca. The range for the HOs is enormous. The saguaros end in Southern Sonora. The organ pipes used to go down to central Sinaloa. They don't anymore. The Cardon Sahuesos are limited to, to Sonora and Baja California, but the HOs begin in Sonora and extend all the way almost into Guatemala. So they are a very, very wide ranging, probably the widest range of any columnar cactus. And they do, as you can see, get very tall here. And I have a, a related species, which I will show you later on. Um, unfortunately for these HOs, they tend to grow in what's called tropical deciduous forest, which happens to be also the prime lands that when cleared uh, become good for grazing. And so 90% of the tropical deciduous forest in the state of Sonora and elsewhere have been cleared and planted with seed uh, for cattle grazing. So that great uh, and very diverse habitat has been almost eliminated and all the cacti that grew in there. Next slide, please. Now, I wanna take you on a journey um, into the state of Oaxaca because in Oaxaca and the state of Puebla, are forests of cacti that my journeys took me to that I never conceived of. And because I found that cacti were so important uh, to native peoples, the, the saguaro for the Tonalatan, the Cardon Sahuesa for the Ceres, the Pitaya, the organ pipe for the Mayos, and the Echo for the Mayos and Guadijillos, I thought, hey, I'm onto something here. So I decided to expand my travels into on the Puebla and Oaxaca, the lowlands, the desert lands, and there are cacti there, and I'll go rapidly through these. Um, this is one of my favorite roads in the world. I'd have to tell you how to get there. Uh, these cacti are known as tetechos. They are a, a uh, distant relative of the saguaro. For a long time, it was believed that they were a close relative, but recent, recent genetic studies show they're, they're really not terribly close. Um, but this is in the, almost the boundary between the state of Puebla and the state of Oaxaca. And these tetechos grow in enormous numbers, as we will see. Next slide, please. If you think uh, you, you'll have a nice journey ahead of you, in August sometime, it's quite warm, but take a walk down this road and you'll think that you have never seen a place like this before. There are relatives of Ocotillos, there are Bursaras, there are cacti in, in numerous numbers, there are uh, legumes that uh, don't make it even out of those valleys. And I have to warn you that there is a tree um, that is known as incha huevos, which means it makes testicles swell. Uh, and it is very well avoided by local people and 
Outsiders come in and are not aware of it and they suffer the consequences. Next slide, please. I told you I'd show you the largest uh, species of Colactus, and this is it. This is Pacasirius weberi, the uh, Cardonso weso is Pacasirius prii. Uh, so this is a close relative, but this is in the state of Oaxaca. They Oaxaca and Puebla in the state of, of Guerrero as well. But this is not an exceptionally large uh, cactus here. The fellow standing below is Fritz Jandry, who for many years worked in the, uh, uh, at the Arizona State Museum, dear friend. He uh, was, uh, I was lucky enough to have him go along with me on a trip a few years ago. So this is the, the great, they call it the candelabro, uh, but it also produces huge numbers of fruits, but it has even more uses. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry for the darkness of this, but uh, this is a very large plant. Um, in the middle, you see a dark space between the ribs. And if you have really good vision, you will see that uh, my friend Jeff Bannister is standing in there, right up in that very dark space. Um, and if there were more light, you would see his hat. He was able to climb up into it. But because of the size of these plants, not only do they use the fruit, they use the ribs, uh, they make a, a wine and actually a liquor from the fruits, um, but they use them to store hay forage for their livestock, to keep it away from uh, ravaging burrows, uh, from uh, goats that shouldn't be there. Uh, and it's a great storage. So here's a cactus that's actually used as a, a hay storage facility. Next slide. They get very large. Um, to give you an idea, if you look at the base of this cactus, you will see a head. Uh, that head is the, <laughs> it's the head of Graham Charles, who is a, a British uh, cactus expert who um, a friend of his uh, joined me in Oaxaca and we went uh, cactus hunting. Um, unfortunately, I hate to tell you, this plant died about three years ago. I watched it for about 10 years. Um, and it was known as one of the biggest ones around, but people have told me that there are even bigger ones, but I would have to walk quite a way to find them. Uh, so this is the Pacasirius Weberi, named after Mr. Weber, um, from Puebla and Oaxaca, an extraordinary plant. And they, they do exist by the millions in that region. Next slide, please. <clears throat> There are thickets and groves of cactus in this area, the valleys of Tehuacan and Cuicatlan in, in Puebla and Oaxaca, that have a density of, of uh, cacti that we can't even conceive. This photograph is taken inside a botanical garden near the town of Zapotetlan Salinas in the state of Puebla. And as you can see, they grow very densely and that shrub at the bottom is a mimosa. And so if you, even if you could pass through between the cacti, you wouldn't want to, but it is a stay a minute that grabs you and tears at your skin and your clothing. I don't recommend it, but this gives you an idea. These plants do not produce fruits every year. They are hit and miss, but when they do produce fruits, uh, they are delicious, they taste like figs, they look like saguaro fruits, but they gather seeds and they make a pipian, a salsa. Um, they uh, use them, they can, and they use them for almost everything. And the lumber from these plants is very strong and used to be used as for building houses. Next slide. Uh, in, in these valleys, you get some very tall cacti. This is a different species. This is a, the previous one, the Tetecho, is, is Neobux baumia tetezzo. This is a Neobux baumia mescalaensis from mescal. Uh, and you can see my friend Alberto Borca standing at the base of this. Um, these do not branch. And they, they have flowers that are that uh, whose husks are black when they flower, they grow way down the stalk, very different. And we'll see more of them in just a second. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, a different plant in, uh, in these valleys, this is one called the um, orange headed organ. It's uh, uh, its own genus, Mitrocereus. And this is a, a place which has one of the most diverse uh, flora that I have ever seen. Um, it's in the state of Oaxaca on a hillside, very rough country. But I show you this to show you how the vegetation changes. This shot was taken in January, and you can see how the cacti then rise way above this very dense vegetation. 
And next slide. This is the same place, same photograph in July. So the rains come beginning in, in May down there. And by July, the place is leafed out and it is a glory for the person who is interested in plant diversity and cactus diversity. These grow quite, these grow up to uh, uh, above 6,000 feet in some places. So they don't, they're not confined to the very low tropical mountains. Next slide. I promised you cactus forest. And this is one near the uh, town of Sapotitlan Salinas. These are tetechos. And as you can see, they grow in colossal numbers and they grow over a fairly wide area. There are untold millions of these. Um, they are all large. They do produce, as I said, fruit, not as, not as much as, as others, but they are a huge resource. And people come from all over the world to see these groves of cactus as they should. Next slide. There are 18 species of columnar cacti in these valleys. And this is a different one. This is my, my friend, Judith Becerra, who will be a co-author, uh, the first author on a book we're writing on the genus Bursera. But this, uh, this particular area abounds in these cacti. They produce a fruit that is marketed on the highways and in the towns. Again, a, an abundance of free resources from cacti. Next. Another one, this is called the Viejito, and you can call it old man. Um, one wonderful thing about this genus, Pilos, this genus, Pilosocerius, is that the fruits, have, the fruits have no spines. They have scales. So you can pick them right off the plant. You can peel them and eat them. They do stain your clothes. Uh, these are found only in this area in Puebla and Oaxaca. Next. Uh, another, a close relative of the tetechos, and you can see how high they grow. This is near the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, where they grow very, very tall, over 40 feet tall, uh, in huge numbers. So what we think we know of as cactus forest in the states of Oaxaca and Puebla can show us things that we can't even imagine here. Tropical climate helps, desert climate helps as well. And this is, believe it or not, you're in the tropics and you have a desert. Next slide. I promised you one uh, relative of the echo cactus, and here it is. This is the only grove of these within about 75 miles. Why this grove is here, I don't know, but they get to be 45 feet tall. Um, this is uh, Pacaceris grandis. The grandis means big, and they do. Um, and I was very lucky to have found this, uh, but they produce fruits that are very similar to the echos. But since they grow only here, not a lot of people know about it. In the town, which is nearby here, they know them very well. And they were able to take me to this grove. Next slide. Another spe species. Again, I told you 18 species. You can see my friend Graham Charles here. Again, you can see his hat down here growing. These plants are found only in a very small area in the state of Puebla. Uh, they're known as the um, red-headed organ. Uh, because you can see that reddish growth at top. Next slide. And they and the relatives grow in huge numbers. This is near the little town of San Juan Raya in the state of Puebla. And this forest goes on and on and on. And local guides can take you to walk through it. It's very carefully patrolled by these indigenous communities. Next slide. Hey, one last shot of the, the the uh, Valley of Tehuacan here. These are called viejitos. And you can see they're they are like soldiers marching up the hillsides. They flower only on the north side where you can see those that, that uh, bushy place that's called the pseudocephalium. And they're on the north side where the fruits are protected from the rays of the sun, which can get very, very powerful down here in the desert, found only in the states of Oaxaca and Puebla. Next. And here are two more. And I show you these both because they are prolific fr fruit producers, known very well in their communities. The large plant on the left are found in a very small area in, uh, right at the border between Oaxaca and Puebla. The other grows through the central valleys, but never in this size. And you can pick its fruits. They're the size of the grapes. And you can pluck them and eat them right off the cactus. Next. Very briefly to South America, this is the 
uh, in the, val the valley of the Rio Marañón, a major tributary of the Amazon. And you can see that in South America, they have columnar cacti as well. And my journeys took me here to try to find out what good these plants were. Unfortunately, they, this is a very remote area and there were not a lot of people that I could ask, but they grow in huge numbers and great variety. So if you want to see the full spectrum of columnar cacti, you have to go to northern Peru between two mountain ranges and they grow only in this area. Next. And the, the final plant, this is one that um, grows in the Atacama Desert. And uh, my, my friend here, Maria, uh, Maria Jose Figueredo, who was an Argentine um, scholar, is standing next to this strange cactus. It's um, also called candelabra, believe it or not. Uh, it is uh, odd in that it grows up to, as you can see, about eight feet and then puts out branches with no spines. And the reason for that is that the Wanakos, the wild ancestors of the Yamas, are notorious for grazing. As you can see, there's no other plants around for them to graze. This place will go years with no rainfall. But the top where those spines end is the point where the Wanakos can't reach anymore. So <laughs> the two plants, or the plant and the animals have evolved together. And the plant said, why bother putting out spines if nothing, we don't need any protection there. So the fruits, which are eaten, and unfortunately, these make for good lumber as well. So nearby, when there are people living nearby, the plants don't last. Fortunately, there, there's nobody left by here and they, these will live for hundreds of years. Next slide. Now, the great problem we have with saguaros, and this is my front yard in Tucson. I, I wanna point out to you that here's, here's one of the limitations of saguaros. You have three species here of columnar cactus. Uh, the saguaro, you can see right in the, at the bottom of the slide. Then to the, uh, at, to the left is a South American cactus, the Sonia corinae, called the toothpick cactus. And then on the right side is the totem pole cactus, which comes from one or two canyons in Baja California. You see those all over uh, Tucson, they're, they're cloned from that. Now, they were all planted at the same time, about 30 years ago. They were all put in the ground at about the same height, about eight inches tall. So in that time, my saguaro has grown maybe another 18 to 20 inches while the Stetsonia has grown. And, and, and since I so, took this photograph uh, last uh, year ago, last spring, it has grown another foot or two and put out three more arms. So saguaros grow very, very slowly. The other cacti grow very fast. So if you're interested in landscaping, well, the saguaros are wonderful to have, but you need to plant them when you're young and hope that you can see them in full bloom and fruiting by the time you die. And thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to entertain any questions you might have or love to hear your comments. Okay, we do have a couple questions in the Q&A. Lois Eisenstein is asking, to what extent would cattle grazing account for relatively few saguaros growing or reproducing on Arizona flatlands? They do certainly have an influence, um, but the biggest influence is rainfall. Uh, in Saguaro National Park to the east, um, it was established because of the prolific growth of very large saguaros back in the 1930s. By the 1950s and 60s, those saguaros were disappearing. And it was with great alarm that ecologists began to study them. And at first they thought the, the uh, death and the lack of new plants was due to a disease. Then they discovered that no, it was not due to a, to a disease, but it was the fact that there was too much grazing there and woodcutters were cutting down the mesquites, Palo Verdes, et cetera. Saguaros, when they are very young, if they get a good year, when, they, when the uh, seeds will germinate, need to have protection. It's called, they need to have what's called a nurse plant. And that nurse plant then gives them shade and will also help protect them from herbivores or predators. In the absence of those, there was no recruitment going on. So as soon as the uh, grazing was eliminated from uh, Saguaro National Park, and the vegetation allowed to grow back, the saguaros have come back. 
not in the numbers that they had back in the 30s. But if you go to the Tucson mountains where grazing was never a big issue because it was too, uh, too rocky, you will find from the 1983 floods, huge recruitment of young saguaros by the tens of thousands. Um, and their grazing was not a consideration. And the rock um, with the few shrubs that grow in the Tucson mountains gave them excellent protection as nurse plants. And so that's sort of a living proof that grazing does make a difference, but not the only difference. And wood cutting made a difference, but not the only difference. The big factor was really the absence of the recruitment rains, which occur very rarely, 1941, 1967, 1978, and really 1983 and 84, the big ones. Okay, uh, Elizabeth Murphy has a couple questions. Uh, first one is, which columnar cacti are most in danger? I don't think that any of them can be considered to be endangered per se. Uh, fortunately for the saguaro in Arizona, the biggest groves of them and the most, the, the thickest groves, the oldest plants are pretty well contained um, in national parks and um, in lands that were not going to be exploited. In Sonora, where there are a lot of them, that's not the case. There is not much protection but most of them grow in rural areas that are not endangered by a, lot, a great deal of uh, urban development or even uh, poaching. Now, they are popular, especially in Mexico now for the soil ribs to make into furniture and, and knickknacks. Uh, the biggest danger though, is the uh, appearance of buffalo grass throughout Sonora and Arizona. Uh, deliberately introduced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to benefit ranchers to, because the grass grows much better than native grasses. But the, the buffalo grass catches fire, as we saw in the fires, in the Bighorn Fire back uh, last summer in the Catalinas, and that killed thousands upon thousands of saguaros. The, the grazing isn't the big problem. The endangerment comes from that grass. It tends not to grow in very rocky substrates. So where you have, such as in the Tucson mountains, where you don't have much soil for the, the um, buffalo grass to grow, soil seem to be doing okay. The National Park Service has an aggressive policy to try to eliminate the buffalo grass. But if you look at Tumamoc Hill and A Mountain, you will see that that's a very tough challenge. Those hills are covered with buffalo grass and sooner or later they will burn and kill the saguaros. Can you describe the taste of saguaro wine? Um, it is sweet, a teeny bit vinegary, but pleasing and very thirst quenching. The autumn, of course, are the experts at production of it. And at their, their wine ceremonies, they took great advantage of its, uh, of its virtues. I think we might have one more question. Thank you, Darlene. I'm a financial economist and uh, I had never thought about it until this hour. Are there uh, agriculturalist farmers who uh, make a living like, uh, you know, American corn farmers? And, and if so, what would be a, a decent kind of uh, uh, revenue? Uh, you know, if you raise corn at five or six dollars a bushel in, in Illinois, you get 200 bushels an acre. So you get a revenue of $1,000 an acre. Are there comparables? Uh, are there farmers that do that with any of these cacti? Yes, there are. In the, in the states of Oaxaca and Puebla, um, there are a couple of species very closely related to the organ pipe that uh, you, can, you can cut off a branch and stick it into the ground and it will grow quite quickly. And there are now orchards, um, and I would say a few thousands of acres that are planted with those and the fruits then are harvested and immediately shipped to Mexico City where they sell out immediately. Um, they combine those uh, with other crops because uh, it's only about a, a six week window of uh, maturing fruits. So they will plant low lying crops in the same pastures. Um, we made a, 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 some, my associates and I, had some experiments in uh, Sonora with organ pipes and we planted a couple of orchards with the help of the Mayos who know them very well. Um, and it took about 
18 years for baby plants to mature with no, with no additional water uh, to produce enough fruit for them to harvest and sell. So it's a very long-term investment. Uh, and those plants that we planted in 2001, uh, a, a couple of hundred of them, um, have only recently begun to produce fruit. So that's a, that's a bit of a long time to wait for investment to mature. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, is there uh, somebody who has done that, like if you and I had done that 20 years ago, um, what, what might we expect uh, in a, a sensible way, like per acre, the, the produce? I mean, I run into it in jams and, and such like, but I have no idea you know, what the, the value is once it begins to... Uh... Well, I, I, I can't answer that because the Mayos who are now harvesting from that orchard, which is only a, the size of a city lot, uh, actually we had three of them we planted, um, they combine what they pick from there with others. So I can't really estimate which are coming from that study plot and which are coming from the wild plants. So I, uh, it's certainly nothing great right now in another 20 years, it might be. Um, but when the plants are producing fruit, they make daily trips into the markets to sell them. And they make enough there to keep them in food and other supplies during that six week period. But that's only with a combination of the cultivated and the wild plants. Okay, Diane. Yes, uh, so I only have three three slides just as a way to introduce uh, a little show and tell that I'm going to do of some baskets we have from some of the communities that we've been uh, hearing about in northern Mexico and uh, these uh, photographs come from uh, a book that Dr. Yetman wrote the on the Opatas and so uh, that's the book and <clears throat> A really fascinating thing, and if you're able to access David's um, Desert Speaks about the palm weavers, um, you'll learn more about. But these are these are little huts, uh, underground huts called hookies, where the women are weaving the um, baskets and hats in order to keep enough humidity so their materials don't dry out. And I think David, you had a few comments about this picture of yourself, what the woman is doing. Yeah, well, this is Doña Lupana, uh, kind of a fun story. Uh, we're, we're actually, my shoulder there is at ground level. And as, as um, Diane said, they work inside these ukis to keep the palm fiber moist. If they don't, it dries out and cracks. She's got it, she's making a hat in the background there. And you can see that what looks like a, a, a jumble of fibers is actually a hat being made. But she has also woven a protective coat around this bottle made out of the pine fibers. And the bottle is intended to carry the local mezcal called Bacanora. And what, when we fell, I, I knew all about this. I had been here before. So we went to this town, a little town of Buena Vista. And that's a tiny little town in Eastern Sonora. <clears throat> when we filmed here, I uh, thought, well, if she's got a, a bottle there that is supposed to have Bacanora, they ought to have a supply of Bacanora somewhere. Her husband was sitting outside um, in a chair waiting very patiently. And I said to him, I Don Juan, um, we would like to be able to film a, a, a Bacanora still. Um, do you have one? He says, yeah, I've been waiting for it. I'll take you over there. Well, it's, it was, it's illegal. It was at that time. Anyway, we, uh, we went four or five miles out and here, sure enough, he had a, a still. Uh, which the guys were working. They cut down these wild agaves and cut off the leaves and carved up the pinas, which are the, the heads. Uh, but to film that, we had to film it from a field of marijuana. So that was the story of uh, my meeting with Doña Lupana here and her bottle, which uh, I have and has held mezcal or bacanora. Thanks, David. Uh, so I have a few baskets, it's two or three, and ASM, you know, has a huge collections from Northern Mexico. In uh, the 1950s, an anthropologist named Thomas Hinton, who was an associate professor here at the U of A in the Department of Anthropology, conducted field work 
in northern Mexico with the idea of identifying these remnant indigenous communities of the Opatas and Pima Bajos, Guarajillos, and he made some collections. And so we have, we have examples of, of basketry. His field notes are in our AASM archives, and I'm sure David has had a chance to look at them. They're very meticulous. They're just wonderful resources for people who are interested in the history and the culture of Northern Mexico. And uh, so here are a few of the, the baskets. Uh, beginning with my favorite, this is one that you can see, uh, and they're all made out of palm fiber and they're very, very finely woven, uh, a twill plating um, technique. And then this one actually has a painting on it. And here's the story about it from, from the field notes. Uh, Maria Flores de Acido of Ponita, a daughter of Carmen Cruz, came over and asked me if I would photograph her baby. I walked over to her house and did so. She showed me a little palm oya about six inches high that had been woven by Bernava Sonoki. It was an excellent done job. However, Maria had painted flowers on it with house paint. She later gave me the Oya, which is now in the Arizona State Museum. So we were able to, to know that the basket and the painting of it were by different artists. Uh, he, he did a lot of uh, research into those hookies and writes that many of the houses have hookies uh, to weave palm in. They're called, and they um, can, he peeked inside one of them and photographed inside and there was the piles of uh, palm leaf and a patate to sit on or a, a, a mat to sit on. So in these uh, hookies, they were making the hats, the baskets and also these uh, sleeping mats, the patates. We walked then over to a store on a street that leads away from the square. It was run by an elderly man named Matinsky. Max says he's a Russian mestizo. We had several palm sombreros in his store. He had several palm sombreros from his store uh, where the Pima Bajos and the Warjios come to trade. And he bought two or three of them. And here's some examples of, here are the best, the hats that he, he um, bought that are in ASM collections. Again, very close up there extremely finely woven and they're a little bit smaller than you can imagine a lot of Mexican sombreros. Another ethnobotanist named Howard Scott Gentry had, who also did research in this area described um, these hats. Ethnobotanist, uh, yes, Howard Scott Gentry noted that they're smaller and more finely woven than Mexican sombreros. And they were the one article on a dressed Indian, which most quickly identified that, that weaver as Guarajillo. So these are very distinctive uh, hat types. And uh, then finally, I'll just be showing some of the, a couple of the, the small baskets that are, have that same very fine. And uh, David, what is the genus and species of the palm uh, plant that is used? Do you know? You have to take off your... Yeah. Okay, um, the palm is Sabal Uresana. Now, Uresana is from Ures, the town in Sonora, where there is still a village where there, some weaving is done. Yeah. So Sabal Uresana, the, the Ures palm. Okay, so, so then finally, uh, because there was that picture of the hookie here, is a basket a hat that hasn't been finished. These are all woven in a double layer. And so uh, you start in uh, the center here and weave out and then you weave to the end and you turn around and head back up. So this is a hat that's similar to the one that you might have seen in the, the picture of David's. Thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you enjoyed this little tour of Cactus Land uh, from Dr. Yetman. <laughs>